Welcome to this discussion with Michael A. Benson of Gangsters versus Nazis, How Jewish Mobsters Bottled, Battled Nazis in Wartime America. Um, I believe I got the subtitle right there. Uh, I'm I'm Akiva Hoffman. I That's how I'm known in writing circles, at least. And I'm a volunteer at Congregation Tehia, who's sponsoring this event, and also co-host the Speculative Wisdom science fiction Zoom book club that um, is reading science fiction by Black, Indigenous, people of color authors, queer authors, women, and sometimes Jewish authors, but uh, mostly we're reading science fiction and fantasy and discussing it through the lens of Jewish tradition. Um, this is not a sci-fi event today. This is a, a history event, and uh, we're very excited that Michael Benson could join us. And I want to, um, before we get into the uh, content of today's discussion, um, just want to put out a content warning. This, uh, because we're talking about battling Nazis in the street, um, it is going to touch on all kinds of things related to crime, violence, anti-Semitism, genocide, murder, sex trafficking, gambling, prison, execution, police violence, uh, police protection, corruption, and possibly even Nazi pedophiles. So um, it's, it's some pretty, pretty intense content we might get into. I uh, want you to be aware of that before we get started. Um, something we've been doing uh, for improving uh, access for people with uh, visual impairments is to do a self-description. So I'll give an example and then I'll ask Michael to describe himself for uh, the visually impaired who may be uh, viewing this either you know today or later on on YouTube. So um, I am a rather fair-skinned, uh, pink genderqueer person with uh, graying brown hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing cat eye glasses. And I have a little necklace with a Merkava um, on it. And I have a bunch of books behind me, which are actually a Zoom virtual background that represents one of my favorite books in sci-fi and fantasy circles. Uh, Michael, I'd invite you to uh, just give a brief self-description. Well, sure. I'm a 65-year-old white man uh, with a white beard. I'm wearing my reading glasses right now. I'm wearing a baseball cap and a golf shirt and cargo shorts, which is about what I wear from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, I was raised German Catholic. Uh, I went to college on Long Island at Hofstra University, which was 80% Jewish and came out with an you know, honorary degree in being partially Jewish. Uh, <laughs> although my background in uh, as a uh, descendant of German Americans was, was very helpful in writing the book. Uh, I know that very small percentage of German Americans were Nazi sympathizers and the rest had to fly American flags for the entire life of World War II or else risk getting a rock through their window. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, I was gonna say before this um, before writing this book, it looks like you've been writing true crime. Oh, I should go back. Sorry, I'm going to talk about the structure of our time. I'm going to. Ha I have some questions planned for Michael, and as we're talking, I encourage people to put questions into the chat, um, and then we'll review the chat and and bring up more questions as we get further along. Hoping we have 20 to 30 minutes for questions from the attendees. So um, that's how we'll manage it. Um, I'll answer anything. Okay, super. Um, I was going to say, before Gangsters versus Nazis, it looks like most of your writing has been in the true crime genre. I'm curious what got you interested in this topic in particular? The, you mean Gangsters versus Nazis yes. in particular? Yes. Um, well, I was, uh, I was chosen to write this book. My, uh, my agent, my literary agent, Doug Grant, had originally, originally offered, it was his idea, offered the book to a, uh, a uh, college professor in Tel Aviv who decided not to. And uh, I, was, I was the second choice. And I was the choice because I had, uh, for three years, edited a boxing magazine. I knew about fights. Uh, I had spent the last five years writing about the mafia, both the Jewish uh, gangsters and the Italian gangsters. Italians got all the press, but the, the Jewish gangsters were very, very important during the Great Depression. Um, so I was, I was the second choice. And, and when I heard the idea, I knew that because it could, if dealt with grimly enough, and you, you listed the subject matter that we touch upon, 
Now, considering that all, the book includes all of those things, including pedophilia, it's a remarkably lighthearted book. It's written uh, in almost as comedy. Uh, no one dies in the entire book because these are fist fights and brawls. They are not shootouts. Um, and uh, I was afraid, I think, that I didn't want the book to be seen as an emotional counterpoint to the Holocaust, which nothing can be. But it is a book in which uh, Jewish men and Nazi sympathizers fight again and again and again, and the Jews win every single time, which I think makes it, you know, good summer reading. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I was noting the kind of Damon Runyon-esque feel to the narrative. Well, I've, I've had a Damon Runyon-esque life. Uh, yeah. You, you can usually find me at the, at the racetrack or the ballpark. Uh, I've, Okay. You know, yeah. I've 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 lifelong friends, one of whom's dad was known as Broadway Eddie. I think actually has a character based on him in Guys and Dolls. Oh, cool. And I went to college with the grandsons and granddaughters of a lot of the uh, the, the Jewish gangsters in the book. You know, in particular, the ones from Brooklyn. So they That's moved out to Long Island a generation later, and then their kids went to school with me. Yeah, that's that's neat. I, I've got I got a question later on about some of the connections and and interesting interweavings of of these lives with uh, various people. But um, I I, I want to say I love the way you start off with the Captain America comparison because there's well, that whole picture from comics, you know, where the people fighting for truth, justice in the American way, and kind of you know the upstanding Steve Rogers kind of guy, and then the contrast of like, well. Who was actually punching Nazis? And... Well, well the, Steve Rogers was from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and these guys were too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think any of them had blonde hair or, <laughs> or went by the moniker Captain America. But yeah, you had guys like uh, like Greasy Thumb Guzik and and uh, and Bugsy Raymond and uh, Mickey Cohen. And so these were the real Captains America who punched Nazis in the nose and and, and discouraged them from meeting in larger groups and forced them underground during the depression. Now, I used to say that because Pearl Harbor put an end to this part of the story, because it redefined everybody's roles, um, that this was a, a, a isolated pocket of history, but it really does leak out in the sense that uh, intelligence gathered so that the gangsters would know who to punch lists of Nazi sympathizers were then later used after Pearl Harbor to weed out these guys who tried to get take jobs on the docks or at shipbuilders where sabotage would have been possible. Right. So, it, it, you know, not only did the pre-war uh, part of American history uh, be less fascist because of these gangsters, uh, the, uh, the war itself was aided by them. Yeah. Because we told people they don't have to read the book before attending. Oh, that's not true. You have to read the book. <laughs> no, they have to read it afterward if they didn't oh, read okay. it before. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I want to go over so, a little bit of the basics. Could you give us just a quick back of the napkin? Who were the German American Bund and the Silver Legion? Okay. Uh, kind of stuff yeah, it, it's, it's 1938 America. We're almost a full decade into the Great Depression. And because there are no uh, hate speech laws, uh, it, Groups could say whatever they wanted about other groups, and as long as they didn't say anything obscene, and by that I mean sexual content, or shout fire in a crowded room, they could say whatever they wanted, including let's kill all the Jews. Uh, and because nobody had any money in so long, very easy to create scapegoats. The Jewish people were used by the Nazi sympathizers as those scapegoats, uh, particularly effective in parts of the country where there weren't many Jews. Or you know, people had never met one, so you, you could tell them they have horns. You, you know, and then you could get suckers to believe that. Um, and uh, and and that that's basically the the premise of the that the meetings of the German American Bund and, and the Silver Lodge were getting larger and larger, and there was no legal way to stop them. Uh, book takes place entirely in the twilight zone between what is just and what is legal. The good guys break the law. They commit assault. Um, they uh, and the bad guys are protected by free speech and are not committing and not uh, breaking the law. That all changes after Pearl Harbor when all of a sudden free speech becomes sedition because we're at war with Germany. So the uh, and it was 
I knew parts of the story for years. I mean, I knew that Mickey Cohen had bopped uh, some Nazis out in L.A. I, I, I knew a, a little bit about what Meyer Lansky had done. And uh, I knew some of the Chicago story from reading the 26 volumes of Warren Commission exhibits and testimony. Uh, but until I found out about Judge Nathan Perlman, who was the catalyst for all of this, that, that this was an organized effort to hinder Nazism in America started by a representative of the Justice Department, which, and then I knew we had a story that needed to be told. Yeah, that, that's really something. I was actually going to have you read from, uh, starting on page 55, you kind of have a reconstruction of that, how that phone call or that conversation might have gone well, uh, with Judge Perlman and Meyer Lansky, I, starting from um, In a World of Thieves to the end of the chapter. It's not real long. I am not sure I have the same. Oh, I, I'm on page 49 within a while. Is it 49? I, I have okay. the pre-published oh, the, the advanced copy reader copy yeah, with okay. all of my arrows and I wouldn't yeah. deface an actual hardcover copy. Okay. <laughs> Might be able to sell that. Um, <clears throat> sure. Now, what, what happens to Judge Perlman is uh, he's pretty fed up with these Nazis. He goes to a, uh, a ceremony in the lower tip of Manhattan and it's forced inside by the German-American Bund marching and carrying signs and chanting. And he, he knows what he needs is a, an army of men to fight these guys. They need to be Jewish because Gentiles don't care. They need to be comfortable with hurting people because that's the job. And they have to be comfortable breaking the law. So he's sitting over a cocktail one evening and he snaps his fingers and he realizes that the person to call is Meyer Lansky, the greatest of all times Jewish gangster. And now I'll read. In a world of thieves, Lansky was an honest man. He'd make a deal and then stick to it. The deal might not have been legal, but it was honest. He wouldn't cheat you and he didn't cut corners. He did what he said he was going to do, a tremendously valuable asset in a world of backstabbing rats. He lived to be old because of that integrity. It was the Paul Malls that ended up killing him. It's a brand of filterless cigarettes. So it was this man who was in the process of building and operating a strip of fantastic casinos and clubs in Havana, Cuba, with his millions of dollars in bootlegging money, who answered the phone one day, and it was Judge Nathan Perlman on the other end. The judge said he needed a face-to-face -face meeting. Lansky said, sure, and Perlman went to him. He brought Rabbi Stephen Wise with him, so he could lay on some guilt if Lansky gave him a hard time. These fucking Nazis, they're becoming bolder with their shenanigans. They march in the street and they are anti-Semites and they think we are soft, Meyer, the judge said. I hate that too, Lansky said. It is a movement, Perlman said. Powerful men are openly making anti-Semitic remarks. Some of the newspapers and magazines are backing them up. Nazism is flourishing in the United States. It's no good, Lansky agreed. You got some boys who might want to punch a Nazi. Lansky says, I do. Judge, rabbi, respectfully, you understand we can do better than punch. We could give somebody a deal, very deterrent to the survivors. Oh, I'm sorry, we cannot condone killing. There must be no killing, the rabbi said. Perlman nodded in agreement. Meyer saw the wisdom in this and told them so. It's always better not to shoot, right? but there will be violence, am I correct? Oh yes, let me rephrase. I want you to do anything but kill them. You have the men, I, have, I know just the crew in Brownsville. The boys in the press call them murdering. Good, I understand you are professionals. I'll arrange to have you paid. I, I need no pay, judge. I am a Jew and I feel for the Jews in Europe who are suffering, they are my brothers. Okay, Perlman said, no money, but if you guys get in trouble, I'll make sure there's legal assistance for you. I appreciate that, Judge Lansky said. Of course, that meant Perlman now owed Lansky a favor. Well, so be it. This was important. When the rabbi stepped out of the room for a moment, Lansky asked, pipes okay? Baseball bats? Yes, yes, just don't kill them, Perlman replied. Broken bones, I think, are to be encouraged. They should know that being a Nazi is dangerous. 
Meyer thought the no kill rule took a little bit of the fun out of it, but leaving a big mouth kraut wailing in pain was satisfying too. So he agreed to the terms. As the rabbi returned to the room, Lansky had one more request. I assume you have some influence with the press, Judge. Some? The Jewish press? More? If we get caught, please, no bad ink. I don't want anything in the Jewish papers that my wife shouldn't read. Deal, Perlman said, and as the men shook hands, he added, mazel. Yeah, so it's just fascinating to me the the connections that were made and sort of parameters set around this, you know, it's like they had very, a very clear mission. And it, and it couldn't happen today. I mean, we were really in a time when people were very slow to pull their gun and there were guns out there. It just wasn't civilized. Uh, you know, you didn't bring a knife to a, to a fist fight and uh, everybody was living by the same rules they lived in the, in the playground days. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's, interesting it's, point. it's interesting that, yeah. And, and I mean, not only didn't the gangsters kill anybody, you know, the Nazis didn't kill anybody either. A lot of, you know, a lot of them did, they fled. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they had genocide but... plans, but they were, yeah. So they they were holding these rallies and, and so on. And, and let's say that someone gets in, you know, Lansky's organization or Judge Perlman or, or someone gets a tip off about a Bund event happening, what sort of things would happen next? What, what sort of actions would be taken? Well, they, they, they functioned as a, a, a guerrilla army. Usually they would wait till after nightfall and surround the building. Um, I know in Newark, New Jersey, they, they almost always started by throwing a stink bomb into the arena itself. And then waiting at all the exits and, you know, popping the guys in the nose as they came running out. Uh, at the Yorkville riot, uh, the gangsters, the Murder Inc. guys, invaded from three different entrances at once. And although a lot of the, the fighting was just along the outer edges because the arena itself was pretty packed with people. Uh, there, were, there was no blowback. I mean, they, they, uh, they put a hurt on the Nazis suffered no injuries in return. And, and this, this is really a brilliant part. Lansky brought a box of brand new American Legion hats. And he had his boys all put on a hat, go in, do their thing, and said, lose, lose the hats on your way out, which they did. And the sidewalk was just covered with them. And sure enough, newspapers the next day say, well, we think it was somebody from the, uh, the American Legion that, 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 that incited the riot. And it was, a, it was a technique that was stolen from Albert Anastasia, who also worked with Murder, Inc. And they would put on hats made in Chicago before they whacked somebody in Manhattan, lose the hat on the way out. And the papers would say, please think that they brought in a hit team from Chicago when the actual shooters are in Brownsville, Brooklyn, sitting in you know, Midnight Rose's back room playing cards. It's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. So what, what kind of public reaction was there to this? I mean, it sounds like the, there's a mix of like, sometimes the police were arresting people. Sometimes the police were protecting the, the mob sometimes, you know, it, it, and, and then the public sentiment, I'm not, not always sure, like, you know, how did this go down in, in terms of the papers and average person, because with the hindsight, with hindsight, it's clear to everybody, right. well, pretty much everybody, what the Nazis were about. In 1938, your Gentile neighbor might think, well, you know, this is just a cultural event or something, you know? Well, that's right. In, in 1938, um, seems hard to imagine now, but most Americans were against going to war against Hitler. You know, he'd conquered most of Europe and still, you know, Mr. and Mrs. America didn't think we had a dog in the fight. Uh, Jewish Americans saw it differently because they knew horrible things were already happening in Europe. They were getting letters uh, from relatives saying that you know, people were being rounded up and no one was coming back. So you know, the Jewish Americans were the first to realize that war against Hitler was necessary and inevitable and that the war for the hearts and minds of Americans had already begun. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it, was easy to, it was easy to get Jewish people to participate without any harm to their consciences whatsoever. Uh, and it was difficult to get Gentiles unless they were 
you know, relatives of the Germans who broke a nose uh, to, to care one way or the other. You know, it, really, it really didn't change that much other than making the, uh, the, the Nazi groups uh, move further underground and their ranks were diminished to a certain extent by guys who said, I'm not going back to that meeting. You know, they, they got the hoodlums showing up, you know. Right. The York, yeah, the Yorkville Casino riot in, in New York City was the one where they came closest to breaking the no kill rule. And Lansky admits to this. He said, you know, we, you know, we listened to their speech long enough to get a really good hate worked up. Uh, and we tossed one guy out a second story window. And the guy lands on, a, on one leg and, and you know, breaks his femur. And, but if he had landed head first, he would have been dead. And there would have been, you know, Rabbi Wise would have wept. And uh, the whole thing would have been over. So they got lucky in that sense. The guy just broke his life. Hmm. Yeah. You talk a bit about on people who went undercover to find these, uh, you know, find out where the meetings are happening, um, particularly in the Chicago and I think the California chapters. California, there's some yeah. stuff about that. Um, I, Herb Brin, who kind of became a full contact journalist, you could say, but um, if you could share a little bit about the undercover sort of work that was going well, on too. Well, yeah. Uh, Herb Brin. Uh, was a, a Jewish journalist who, as they say, could pass for Gentile. You know, I dealt with both of his sons during my research. Don't say he was blonde. He wasn't blonde. Okay. But he, he could pass for Gentile. And that was what they wanted. He was a, a big guy, athletic. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the German-American blend would want him in their organization if he, if he said he was German, which he did. And he found out uh, where in advance, where the meetings were going to be, because by this time, the word was out that if you announced the meeting in public, the hoodlums were going to show up. So they tried to have meetings in secret, but they were infiltrated by Herb Brin, among others. And he would take that information and go to Davy Miller's boxing gym on Kedzie Avenue in Chicago, where there was a combination of, of Al Capone's guys, uh, boxers training to, to fight. And the, you know, the line between boxers and, and hoods were, was very blurry at that time because boxing was run by the mob and it was very common for boxers between fights and after they retired to do jobs for the mob being you know, muscle. So he, he would relay the message to them and then the meeting that was supposedly secret would happen and boom, the door would fly open and these guys would come in and start you know, smacking guys over the head. That's great. Um, Victoria's got a question that ties into something I wanted to ask. Um, that you know there we know about the purple gang you know since you know the sponsoring congregation for this is a congregation to which is in metro detroit and so people who grew up around here have heard some stories of the purple gang and so on uh which was a jewish uh gang organization but it seems like most of the detroit related content in the book is is kind of on the the Nazi side here. Um, could you talk a little bit about Father Coughlin? And Henry yeah, Ford it, and if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, one purple gang guy does appear in, in the Cleveland. Minneapolis fights. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it, this, this troubles me. Uh, having spent my early childhood in, in my grandmother's house, with very German and Catholic, that Father Coughlin, a Catholic priest, was America's number one anti Semite. He was Father Charles Edward Coughlin. He, uh, he gave his sermons over the radio on Sunday afternoons, right between rhythmic ramblings and design for dancing. It was syndicated. Everybody across the country got to hear him. And he had a soft, velvety voice. He was very soothing. People liked listening to him. And he said, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, hate Jews and love Hitler. And it just horrible. Uh, you know, it, 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 it started out. In 1926, he built his own church, Shrine of the Little Flower. He was given free radio time to promote his church. And for three years, that's what he did. But after the stock market crashed, it slowly but steadily started to uh, turn into a show about scapegoating Jews for the economic troubles that the world was in, that all Jews were communists and the communists had all the money, which of course, must have been quite a shock to the rag man in Chicago whose horse just dropped dead in the middle of the street. Um, now, in particular, he praised the way that Nazis dealt with the Jews. He said that he was against all forms of religious persecution, of course, but since Jew equaled communist, he didn't feel so bad. And it's unclear if he knew about 
the Holocaust. So he, he knew that genocide was underway, but he certainly knew about Kristallnacht, which November 9th, 10th, 1938, when Jewish neighborhoods were smashed and many of the residents killed. Um, Coughlin told America that he wasn't pro-Nazi, he was anti-communist. But since it was, a com it, was, it was the Jews who were making Germany sick like a cancer, how could you blame them for wanting to cut it out? Uh, and again, uh, eventually protest groups, you know, got him dropped from a number of, of radio stations. But it wasn't until Pearl Harbor that he, he, that he completely went away. And he was, you know, people like that want to be on the side that's winning. And after Pearl Harbor, I guess you know, the writing was on the wall that you know, Hitler had too many enemies now. He couldn't handle them all. Yeah, I know some of us drive by the Shrine of the Little Flower um, sometimes. It's a, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. in Royal Oak, uh, Michigan. It's a, it's a very odd. I would think. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I guess you know, beating up a priest probably wouldn't be good PR. Um, I, you know, I, I, I know, I know, I'm a man who uh, who punched out a priest once, and uh, priest had it coming. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that happens too. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. You said it was interesting to me. I didn't realize like the KKK had actually burned a cross on Father Coughlin's lawn be, for being Catholic. Right, right, right. But yes. then he hated Jews, and it's just like you know what kind of mess, you know? The forces of hate don't necessarily all all collaborate. Um, well, it does seem like the far right movements don't always start with the Jews, but they get around to them eventually. Mm -hmm. Which is something to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, how much coordination was there between the Third Reich and some of these groups, you know, agitating in the United States? It varied. Uh, Fritz Kuhn, leader of the German American Bund, the Brown Shirts, as they were known, claimed that he was working under orders from Hitler. And as his proof, he had a large photo on his wall of him shaking hands with Hitler. And it's completely impossible to tell how many photos Hitler had taken that day. Um, and how, what the you know, Kuhn claimed that he was there at the, the beer putsch, where Hitler first got his name in the newspapers. But, you know, Kuhn was also a con man. So perhaps not much. We do know that Hitler was very involved in an earlier attempt to gain control of the Hollywood studios. That, uh, that his idea was that if he could get uh, the Hollywood studios to make pro-Nazi movies instead of anti-Nazi movies, that that propaganda might allow him to conquer the world without, without any more violence, this violence we don't need. Except for, of course, the concentration camps. Um, and what happened was a, a, a lawyer in LA named L.L. L. Lewis put together a little army of his own of, of undercover guys and, and women. Women were very important in this case. And they infiltrated the, the Nazi movement, found out some horrible things that the plans were to kidnap uh, Jewish stars and moguls and execute them in public and to use uh, old, old money in L.A., which was oil money, uh, to, to combat the, uh, the new money, which was movie money in Los Angeles. And none of it worked because Hitler didn't put one person strongly in charge. There were three or four guys vying for the leadership role. And what the Jewish moles did is they just spread rumors. You know, this guy's saying this about you and this guy's saying this about you. And the whole thing kind of fell apart. And then about three years later, it's when, um, when Judge Perlman calls Mickey Cohen and says, uh, you know, can you stop the German-American Bund, which is a completely different story, which by this time, uh, the, the Bund had been, had, was resorting to recruiting homeless men from under the bridges of LA, you know, then is now LA had a conspicuous homeless problem. And they would pick these guys up, take them to the soup kitchen, feed them and, you know, give them a nice speech about hating Jews and loving Hitler. And, and if they stuck around for a week or two, they got a nice new uniform and they could go out marching and do paramilitary stuff and getting ready for the, for the war, which thankfully never came to California. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a strategy. Um, yeah. What, one of the things that, that was striking in terms of 
coordinating efforts. Um, and, and I got to say, I love I love the whole like, you know, disinformation, making people fight amongst themselves and kind of wreck their own plans, um, tactics right. too. But what, what stood out to me that seems very different than a lot of conversations nowadays is the amount of coordination between institutions that don't normally you wouldn't think of as associating with each other. I mean, we've talked a little bit about, you know, Judge Perlman reaching out to um, Meyer Lansky and these other, you know, mobster groups. But could you comment a little bit on the role ultimately played by the FBI and the, let's qualify it, the pre-McCarthy House Un-American Activities Committee? Uh, because that was kind of a surprise to me, like, oh, wow, I, I always know about the HUAC from like the really bad, you know, witch hunts in Hollywood and stuff. But. Right, and that's right. Before World War II, the House on American Activity Committee was a uh, was an anti-fascist group, and they were they they too infiltrated the German American Bund, and, and I'm, I'm going to forget the name of the journalist now. There, there were two brothers who both infiltrated, and because Kuhn was an alcoholic, what these guys would do is they would interview him, you know, in the middle of the day, and he would start drinking, and hours later the questions would still be coming and he couldn't stop talking about himself and they really found out a lot about how the bund worked and Kuhn was a it was an odd duck he was a, not only a you know guy who drank schnapps every day morning noon and night but he was a loner to a weird degree he uh he would travel from outpost to outpost by himself on two occasions fell asleep at the wheel and almost died i mean he, he claims he once woke up and and the car was half hanging off of a bridge, you know, and why lie about something like that? <laughs> I suspect that probably happened. And uh, you know, was, was not, was known to get tossed into sheriff's cells because he would try to mouth off against uh, Americans in, in, uh, in small town America. And they'd say, well, sorry, sorry, buddy. <laughs> You're spending the night in the jail. Um, so yeah. It, and he was also dishonest. He was stealing from his own organization. Uh, he, he eventually was was imprisoned for embezzling money from the German American Bund. So all that money that was supposed to go to to hating Jews and loving Hitler was going to buy fancy cars for Fritz Kuhn. Yeah, kind of funny how like these genocidal people can sometimes be megalomaniacal sociopaths, you know. And uh... well, I, I think that that. Seems yeah, it was like the, uh, the 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 uh, the PR guy for the German American Bund was it was a pedophile. Yeah, you, you promised I'd talk about it, so I'll talk about it. <laughs> okay. he, and he, he was arrested twice within a month, once for exposing himself to a little girl in Penn Station, and then a month later, taking a, a little girl that wasn't his daughter into the movies, but in in a way that uh, aroused suspicion. And luckily, the, you know, the police got there with a flashlight and stopped him before anything really bad could happen. But yeah, this is these are the, the kind of characters, and, and, and perhaps this shouldn't be too surprising that you wouldn't have your, you know, your your, your most virtuous German Americans as the head of your hating group. And again, I should I should note that you know by far like ninety nine point eight percent of no ninety nine point nine oh two two out of every five hundred Germans were Nazi sympathizers. The rest were American patriots. And I was pleased right. to find my hometown's Rochester, New York. When the uh, when the Bund came to Rochester, they rented out a a large uh, dance hall for their their rally, and only a handful of people showed up. Was, you know, I had a great uncle. I was a little worried about, but he it turns out that the, and the local German American group in Rochester said, "Don't don't pay any attention to these guys. They're haters. That's that's not us." Yeah, that's that's good. I mean, that's that's the weird thing. It's it can only take a few people to do really bad stuff. It's important you stop those people, but yeah, it's that they're not representative of a you know an entire community. But, but yeah, if, if Judge Perlman hadn't called Meyer Lansky, we have no idea how big the movement would have gotten mm -hmm. uh, without that organized effort. And of course, we 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 have to speculate on how Judge Perlman knew these guys. Why did he know? Why did he know Meyer Lansky? Why did he know Longy's woman in Newark? And the answer seems to be that uh, they were bootleggers hmm. and Judge Perlman was a drinking man. And I, I suspect that he did not go all of prohibition without a drink. So the fact that he knew the guys who were, who were supplying the booze 
probably has more to do with that than having run into them as part of his role in the Justice Department. Interesting. Yeah. There's such an interesting collection of gangsters, boxers, journalists, judges, lawmakers, and so on in, in, in this book. Um, did you have any like favorites? Like if I could get in a time machine and go have lunch with somebody, who would you want to do that? Well, talk to? <clears throat> you know, I, I like, I like Longies Wilman. Longies Wilman, when he talked to uh, Judge Perlman, he, he already knew what was up. He had been a, uh, a defender of, of little Jewish boys since he was a teenager. Uh, it was not uncommon for you know, little Jewish boys to get picked on by Gentiles just walking down the street in, in Newark, New Jersey. And if you were, if you, that happened to you, you'd shout Longy and Longy would come running and he'd chase off the, you know, the thick necked you know, bullies who had come into, come into the neighborhood. So by the time he's talking to Judge Perlman, he knows what's up. And he puts together the Minutemen uh, with, and I think this is going to be my pick. Nat Arno is, is his boots on the ground heading the, uh, the Minutemen who, like the, the, the guerrilla warfare in uh, the revolution, they could respond in a minute if the Nazis got together and bust up the meeting. Uh, and uh, Arno, uh, after Pearl Harbor, enlists in the, in the U.S. Army. He is in the invading force at Normandy on D-Day. He marches all the way, he tours Europe the hard way, all the way to Berlin, and claims that on two occasions, he saw German POWs being marched in the opposite direction, who recognized him and whom he recognized from street fights they had had in Newark, New Jersey. So it really was the little war before the big war. Wow, that's wild. Yeah, I think there was a, a thing in your book about some people claiming to be Americans that were part of these Bund groups that actually hadn't established, you know, citizenship here. And, and well, yeah, one of the ways they, like they tried to, to, to evade trouble was uh, was to claim to be an American organization. The big rally they had at Madison Square Garden was called the Pro-America Rally. You know, they're going to make America great again by getting rid of the Jews. Um, and there was always an American flag behind the stage next to the swastika flag. There was always a portrait of George Washington right next to the portrait of Adolf Hitler. And that, uh, that any of this was un-American in any way, uh, they would act shocked. You, you misunderstand us. No, 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 no. We're trying to make a, we're trying to improve America with our, with our great German notions of how to run things. Since you don't have a time machine, what what sort of research do you do when preparing for a book like this? Well, I, I luckily I did, you know the internet is. I, this would have taken me twenty years, and I I, I had the books that took twenty years. Um, if I'd had to do it going library to library and then even talking to librarians, it would have taken much longer. Uh, as it is online, you can find the morgue of many many daily newspapers. And what I was finding was that the memoirs of the gangsters and the fighters, I would take that as one half of the story. And then I would find the story as it was reported in the paper the next day and put those two things together and figure out what happened. Uh, because nowhere does it say that a, a bunch of you know, mafia guys ran into a German American bun meeting last night and started to bust heads. It was, there was always a, a mystery as to who the invaders were. And you know, the, the Germans themselves were certain that these were, these were Jews, but the fact that they were taking a licking from them meant that they couldn't really say it very loud because you, know, you, you couldn't have the fear of knowing that you know, five foot five Jewish men broke up you know, our glorious white blue eyed meeting. Um, so you know, a, lot of it, a lot of it was putting pieces together, connecting dots. And it also helped that I, I'm the correct age to know grandchildren of the uh, murdering. Actually, the, the one I know best, his, uh, his grandfather was Murdering's bookie, which is probably a lot less lethal. Yeah, there's lots of jobs in the mob. <laughs> it's, well, yeah, right. Some, somebody had to take the bets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Victoria was commenting that you know that whole idea of of asking family members, you know, what what were you doing when this was heating up, you know, in in Europe and so on, and 
And um, I, I'm not sure if there's a question in there, Victoria, um, but just commenting growing up, you know, being born in Brooklyn, raised in Long Island, you know, dealing with anti-Semitism there, um, but not really getting a clear answer, you know, what people were doing. Did, did, did you want to come call mute and uh, ask a question related to that, Victoria? Oh, thank you so much, Michael. Again, what a, what a wonderful read this book is. And as I said in, in my so comment, filled in so many of the gaps of, of, shall I say, my personal history. But I'm so glad that um, there has been more published and certainly spoken of how anti-Semitic Long Island was. And the yeah, fact that I found myself being raised there um, is is something I still haven't reconciled with. Yes, the town of Yapank uh, and Long Island went completely Nazi. The main street was uh, was Hitler's Strauss. It was uh, Adolf Hitler Street was was where the you went to get your you know egg cream. <laughs> um, and and and, I, and I'll tell you that they still to this day do not want to talk about it. I found nobody in Yap Hank who said, oh, yeah, we used to be Nazi. You know, it made me, it made me a little nervous. Um, and they had a, a youth camp out there. There were youth camps in the United States designed to Nazify young German-American boys and girls. Uh, and there was a string of them. Uh, it, they, the German parents wouldn't know until their kids got to the camp what it was like they get a brochure you know baseball swimming running healthy fresh air send your kid to the german camp they'll learn how to speak german uh and it not until the kids got there to see that everything had a swastika on it and they were going to be brainwashed during their their summer stay there uh and this was a from coast to coast and it's just it's stunning to me they would on sundays they would have parents day and there'd be a parade and the parents would come out and drink beer and uh just just horrible to think about and uh I, I there's no telling you know what what might have happened had japan not bombed pearl harbor where where was where was it headed were, were there enough jewish gangsters and boxers to handle the, the the growing fascist movement i don't know i think at some point you're going to need more um so yes i it's uh Long Island was a scary place, yes. <laughs> Richard asks, um, after the war, did any of the subjects profiled or their successors go after neo-Nazis such as Rockwell's group and alt-right organizations that are still active today? Well, you know, I think Herb Brin falls into that category. Herb Brin dedicated the rest of his life to being anti-fascist and somewhat famously uh, infiltrated. He, he went into a, a neo-Nazi organization and uh, said he was interested in, in what they were up to and if they had any brochures. And he said, and, and can I get one of these coffee cups? And the, the, the woman behind the desk was looking at her coffee cup, which said whatever it said on it, Proud Boys, whatever it was. And uh, she, she says, well, yeah, but I, I, I have to go back in the storeroom to get, a, to get it. He said, I'll wait. And while she leaves, he rifles through drawers as fast as an 80 year old man can do it and fills his pockets with everything that's paper and gets home and finds that he's got enough stuff for three exposés on this group. Awesome. So it just, uh, first of all, just tremendous courage in the man because th th that, that could have gone really bad had he been caught with his hand in the cookie jar, but his entire life was like that. I and mean, when he was a, a, a young man, he, there was a loud mouth anti-Semite on his bus on the Kedzie Avenue bus, he dragged the guy off the bus, beat him up one side of the block and down the other side of the block, and then got back on the bus because the bus had waited for him. Got back on the bus, everybody gave him a standing ovation, and uh, and life went on. So Herb Brin, yeah, he, he, he's the uh, he's the hero of anti-fascists everywhere. The, I was surprised um, to see another household name that I did not expect to see. Um, and that was Jack Ruby. Oh, yeah. Spoiler alert. Uh... <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. I, I am not an expert on the Kennedy assassination and its aftermath, but I know the names Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. Right. And um, yeah. Well, I'll talk about that. Uh, 
yeah, Sparky Rubenstein is uh, is grows up to be Jack Ruby, and he's one of the fighters in Chicago. He's uh, Barney Ross's best friend. Barney Ross was a uh, a multi division boxing champion at that time, and. By 1963, he's a nightclub owner in Dallas, Texas, and is the man who goes down into the uh, the basement of the uh, the Dallas police force and and shoots Lee Harvey Oswald to death as he's being transferred from the city to the county jail. And he is then subsequently interviewed by Gerald Ford, who was future president of the United States, and Earl Warren, who's the... Uh, Supreme Court Justice, and they go to him in his jail cell in Dallas, and he, he leads with this. He says, look, I want you to know I'm a patriot. Back in the day, Barney Ross and I and the boys, we busted a lot of German-American bund heads because he thinks this is going to get their sympathy. So, well, Jack, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're glad about that, but uh, it's not really what we're talking about today. Uh, the implication, I suppose, uh, oh, and then, and then, Ruby says, I wanted the world to know that Jews could be tough. And, and I, I, I read that again recently. And I said, you know, that comes right out of the Judge Perlman playbook. Mm -hmm. That here's Judge Perlman's influence. Now, no matter how demented Ruby was doing what he did in Dallas, uh, he certainly seemed to think he was doing a good thing. Right. He, he stayed more on the like, you know, mob retribution aspect of things then oh the, yeah no he, yeah, he the got in there fascism he, side of things at that he point, got in there you know, like, a like hit man. look this guy's this guy's been you know arrested already like uh yeah and you're delivering a hit that's yeah it's interesting well i think mean, the speculation is that he was ordered to kill oswald so oswald couldn't say who he worked for right yeah there's all kinds of theories there's, right? yeah, there, yeah. there are yeah, and i am a, an expert in the kennedy assassination i wrote okay. two i wrote the encyclopedia of the jfk assassination and who's who in the jfk assassination oh, cool. So yeah, I mean, that probably my first inclination that there were hoods out there whacking Nazis during the Depression comes from Jack Ruby's testimony. Hmm. Wow. What well, were there any surprises for you as you were researching this? Like, whoa! Well, I didn't well yeah, you know, I I, I I I've already talked about the youth camps. The youth camps really, really disturbed me. Uh, Father Co Father Coughlin disturbed me. I just didn't think that that we had gotten to that point. Um, you always, I always assume that um, Americans are smart enough to see through disinformation, but you know, it, it's, it's I've, at this point in my life, I know that's not true. Uh, and you know, Hitler's wanting to take over Hollywood because of the propaganda machine. I mean, today's equivalent is having a far right entity take over a 24 hour news channel on cable, uh, it, it, which has been accomplished. And that we're dealing with the effects of now. Now half the country is getting its information from uh, a parallel universe mm -hmm. that people who aren't on the far right don't don't really recognize. Yeah, yeah. It's, so what, since you're dealing in rather heavy material when you research something like this, and also you're How do I make writing, it so funny. Well, yeah, I think you got to bring bring some uh, pacing and levity to it but um do you have uh some practices for self-care or for grounding yourself so you're like still in touch with the, with the real world and not you know completely in well, the world of you know crime and violence i well yeah i have uh first of all I have, I have a wife and loving family who uh don't let anything don't let things go to my head uh we've been through you know books books that sold seven copies and we've gone through books that were bestsellers together and and I, I try not to to get too too into myself. Uh, when I'm in the middle of writing a book, there's probably no way to keep me grounded. I will pretty much submerge. Um, but you know, I, I I can come out of it and still watch TV with with my family. Uh, but yeah, I, I I can be very very tunnel visioned once I get onto something. Hmm. Yeah, that's why the book sounds like it's written all in one day because it's, it's it's one mindset, and it really does start with Steve Rogers punching Hitler on the cover of Captain America comics number one, and that's that's what Stan Lee wanted you to believe. Here's what really happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the really kind of surprising twists, another one, I, one of many, I should say, for me was uh, Bugsy Siegel 
meeting Goering and Goebbels oh, yeah. in Italy. Yes. This was actually on page uh, 232. I was wondering if you could read just, a, it's like a well, sure. couple of paragraphs. Um, Although I don't think our pages. Yeah, it's not page 232. It starts with, uh, in 1938, Siegel was 32 years old. Um, okay. It's one 232. of those. 232. I think, I think we're, we're five Backtrack pages. a few pages, maybe, because I was six pages ahead of you before. So. Okay. And as someone who didn't grow up in this era, it was interesting for me to learn that Bugsy meant, you know, kind of like cracked Ducks. in the head. Yeah. Like, like I didn't even realize like Bugs Bunny. Like, right, oh, right, right. Sure. Right. Yeah. I, I just thought it was just a name, not like, oh, okay, this person's kind of off the rocker. Um, Could you, you prompt know. me again with the beginning of the paragraph? Okay. The, it's um, in 1938. Siegel was 32 years old. When he was, uh, and you have it on two thirty-two. Yeah, when he was in Italy. Well, I remember the story. Uh, yeah, if you want to just paraphrase, yeah, it, he was he fine. was he was dating a, uh, a a member of of the royal family, and uh, he apparently didn't just didn't like those guys, and he he wanted to shoot them in the hotel in Italy, where he was selling a, a patent for an explosive. Which is another thing I wanted to. I wish I knew more about that. Uh, but his girlfriend tries to talk him out of. It. He says, "Why don't you hate those people as much as I do? We could be, uh, you know, we could be back in, in the, the Hollywood Hills in 24 hours. Or you, like, I can get us a, an airship across the Atlantic. We'll be out of here. Don't worry about it." And she says, "No, you can't do it, Benjamin, because they'll kill my family." I mean, they won't take it out on me. They won't take it out on you. They'll take it out on my mom and dad, and my brothers and sisters. So you can't do it. And that's why the uh, why the, the top Nazi brass survived Bugsy Siegel's trip to Italy. Yeah, we, we don't have an alternate timeline where we see what, what would have happened if uh, that had gone differently. Well, that's, but, yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's like, wow, these people crossing paths you know and so there might have been good for him to just scoop up the whole family and take them to the hollywood right house. right yeah exactly it's uh yeah fascinating stuff well if we've got anyone else that wanted to ask a question now would be the time to uh pop it in the chat or raise your hand if you want to come you can take someone off mute if they'd rather say it aloud While we're waiting for that, do you have any? Oh, Maureen, you've got a hand up. Oh, you. Lot, all the big, so many big cities are mentioned. You know, Cleveland and Chicago and L.A. and except for you know one reference to somebody related to the Purple Gang and of course Father Coughlin, there wasn't a lot of action in Detroit. Is that because there wasn't this? A sizable German community, or was it, or was there something else? Well, I, I, I can only tell you that I followed the fights, and if there wasn't, if there wasn't a fight, chances are your city didn't didn't make it into the book. Um, I would not have included Rochester, except for it's my hometown. I thought that Rochester's inactivity was was interesting. Uh, it, it it may be that only. Only gangsters who were assured of legal assistance if they were caught by Judge Perlman uh, put their lives on the line in order to, to fight against uh, against the Bund. Uh, and that it may be that Judge Perlman just didn't know who to call in Detroit. <clears throat> you know, he, 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 he didn't have a pipeline to the mafia in general or the Jewish mob. But he knew a couple of guys, and he used them to to, to spread the word around. Um, so yeah, I, I would suspect that it's because there weren't any brawls there. Um, yeah, you had mentioned some differences that you see in the environment nowadays versus oh boy, in the nineteen thirty eight. You know, one being that people are much more likely to pull a gun yes. today. There's no code of honor uh, for fights. Um, is that anything else you wanted to? elaborate well yeah it, the, the the movie west side story seems to be about the moment when society graduated from from fighting to shooting 
Uh, and you know, the, the further we get into that, that's the 50s. By the 60s, you know, internal politics are being altered again and again by bullets. We have all the assassinations. Uh, and in 66, we have our first mass shooting on a campus, which is Charles Whitman, University of Texas, not Columbine, it was before that. Um, the, uh, the, the depravity of crime in general seems to amp up dramatically during the mid 60s. Uh, for the first time, we're watching our boys at war on the six o'clock news, which is really angering people because it was a lot easier to make war glorious to civilians who didn't have to actually see it. You know, they knew that guys came back from war looking vacant and with issues, but they didn't know what war looked like until Walter Cronkite showed it to them, uh, at which point uh, our, our, our ability to accept authority's word without question, you know, wore away and to the point now where I, I think it's gone to the other extreme where nobody believes anything that the government says, uh, that it's, it's, all, it's all BS. And uh, you know, don't listen to any of them, listen only to me. Right. It seems to be the, the way it goes. Yeah, like that's gonna be great. We have a question from Victoria. Um, going back to Long Island, did Robert Moses have a part in any of this? Oh yeah, see, I don't know. I know Robert Moses was, uh, was not a pal of the little guy. Um, but I, I don't know if he had anything to do with any uh, pro-Nazi activities. He did build the, uh, the overpasses on the way to Jones Beach uh, low enough so that uh, buses couldn't get there as a way to keep the riffraff out. Need a yeah, car to a, get to Jones Beach. That's quite a look. <laughs> well, let's say, well, he, and he, he, the roads that were necessary to get all those cars from the inner city out to the suburbs uh, could, could have gone around the edges like they did in Brooklyn. In the Bronx, he put them right through the middle and wiped whole neighborhoods out. Um, so, I mean, there are Bronx accents that existed before Robert Moses that, that you don't hear anymore because that's now the Cross Bronx Expressway. Yeah, so many cities. I mean, we have situations, you know, neighborhoods in Detroit that were wiped out by, you know, freeway development and sure. other development, you know, yeah, that's a and people in Brooklyn tragedy. have a little more a little more power, uh, hmm. and the uh, the Belt Parkway, as its name suggests, goes around the outer edge of the borough and really, I mean, it took up some swamp space. Nobody, you know, it, it's uh, Brooklyn survived fine. Hmm. Do you have any other books coming out that you'd like to uh, tell us about? Well, I, this is your latest release. I believe this is. I have one in the can, as they say. It's uh, called the Cigar. I wrote it with uh, former gangster Frank DiMatteo, and it is a biography of Carmine Galante, who is famous for being whacked in a, uh, in a restaurant in Brooklyn. And the Daily News the next day published the picture of the corpse with the cigar still in his mouth. It's fa a famous photo. Mm -hmm. But he was an interesting guy before that. He's not a nice man in any way. He was the world's number one heroin dealer, for example. Uh, but he also, was uh, a, a soldier of Vito Genovese. Now, most of the Italian gangsters were anti-fascist because the fascists and the mafia were competing, uh, competing governments. Uh, but Genovese was deported and probably because his life was on the line, he had to cozy up to Mussolini. And Mussolini says, okay, I'll let you live, but you got to whack somebody in the United States for me. Uh, and it was a guy named Carlos Tresca, an anarchist, a communist, anti-fascist. Uh, and Carmen Galante got the job and uh, whacked him at Fifth Avenue and 14th Street, I believe, and uh, way back uh, around around you know the Great Depression. So that, that's that's the next one. Uh, wow. After that, I don't know. I uh, I'm thinking of writing about something nice. <laughs> Just so I think my brain really does need a place to go for a while. That's not uh, not killing and hurting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been excellent. Everyone. Thank you, Akiva. Please get a copy of Gangsters versus Nazis if you don't have it. Yes, read please. It. There's so much great stuff in there that we didn't have time to go into. I mean, 
even stuff like Lucky Luciano's support for the Allied uh, forces in World War II. There's all kinds of fascinating stuff, and we just touched on some of the highlights here, so I encourage you to read it um, if that's your kind of thing. And this has been a wonderful discussion, and uh, best of luck with uh, this book and the future ones coming out. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Akiva. Take care, everybody. Have a good rest of your weekend.